morning. We are live on a Monday morning edition. This is going to be kind of, Will and I were talking, this is kind of an Emerging Threats Monday reboot, Emerging Threats Monday 2.0. And uh, while we're waiting for folks to jump on, let's do some sponsors to keep this thing paid for and the lights on. There you go. We, yeah, we're very blessed to have amazing sponsors like Precision Holsters. I saw, uh, I don't know if you saw this, C. Klander was posting some photographs from the Nationals and he was standing there with J.J. Rakaz and they were both rocking uh, Precision yeah. Holsters competition. Yeah, that looked on. awesome. Yeah. So Precision Holsters, check them out. I'm wearing the Precision Holsters belt right now, Ultra Appendix Holster as well. And if, the, if you're into competition shooting, I highly recommend their competition line. They're absolutely outstanding. The veteran owned business uh right here in america and they have a no excuse money back guarantee so please check them out there's a deep discount code for everybody that watches coffee with rich and you can check them out by going to american warriorshow.com and clicking on the links and taking advantage of those discount codes and if you're just joining me this morning you're like who is this guy is he some sort of ex-con or something it looks pretty rough uh, actually my name is rich brown i'm the co-host co-founder of the American Warrior Society and the American Warrior Show, America's leading self-defense podcast. I'm a former police officer, corrections officer, special operations officer, and retired Marine Corps officer. And I'm joined once again by my dear friend, Will Wood. And we have a great show for you today. <clears throat> so please like and hit that share button as I talk about our amazing sponsors like Mountain Man Medical. Mountain Man Medical. I mean, I tell you what, they have some amazing products over there. And we finally have the co-branded Trauma Kit between us and Mountain Man Medical, Brian McLaughlin, and all the folks at Mountain Man Medical, they have a free trauma course you can actually take and print a certificate at the end of it. They have uh, discount products over there, as well as the co-branded trauma kit. So please check them out. Cool Fire Trainer. You're going to have to wait a few months, folks, if you want the Cool Fire Trainer, but the worth it's definitely going to be worth your uh, wait time because it will take your dry fire to the next level. Nancy is on. Says morning, y'all. Good morning, Nancy. Please hit that share button to the 10 folks that are joining us live. APPHemp.com is my good friend, Jesse Ross and his family. Jesse's retired Marine Corps gunnery sergeant. We were in the Marines together. Jesse and his family are absolutely artists and hemp growers, growing the finest CBD products in the beautiful mountains of Asheville, North Carolina. Dr. Fuller is joining us. Good morning, Dr. Fuller. Century Martial Arts Makers of the Bob XL. You're going to definitely want your Bob XL. Matter of fact, uh, we had Jay Fujimoto on last week, and he said as you drive down uh, the streets in Hawaii, you see everybody's got their Bob on their front porch getting a strike workout in. And that's what that's what you guys should be doing today, man. You, you're going to have to take, take advantage of that. And that wraps up our sponsor reads. The easiest thing to do if you want to take advantage of all the discount codes that we have here for you at, at Emerging Threats Monday, Copy with Rich and Will, is... Go to AmericanWarriorShow.com and find all of our discount links there. Please hit that share button. So, Will, you want to talk to him about what we're going to be doing here for the next few Mondays for the foreseeable future? Yeah, uh, just we're going to pick a topic, and uh, I think we're going to switch back and forth. You already talked about yours for next week a little bit uh, as we were doing the pre-show stuff. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about Evergrande over in China, the, the major land owner, developer, builder, uh, and the problems they're having and the, the threat it could cause uh, to the rest of the world, almost uh, uh, like Lehman Brothers did to us in 08, 09. Um, we don't know that'll happen, of course, but the, the more we know, the better prepared we can be. <clears throat> yeah. And I tell you, uh, if you're wondering, like, what is a self-defense show and prepared in a show? What does it do in talking about something happening in China? Because the world is so interconnected right now. You don't I mean, you can go read Thomas Friedman's book. Uh, the world is flat, hot and crowded and, and whatever else he's written. But I will tell you, when I was a, a young Marine, I'm like 19, 20 years old, Will, and I'm walking around, you know, with my thumb up my rear end, like most <laughs> young men. And, and I remember, age, man. I, yeah. And I remember my, uh, my NCOs would be like, who's the president of Romania? Uh, you know, mm -hmm. what, what's going on? There was a coup last night in Haiti who's who's the acting president right now yeah and and they it, because these things affect our lives in more ways than we can imagine so it's a good way to keep yourself sharp on the things mm -hmm. that can potentially impact you and your family would you agree with that oh absolutely i mean look i mean 
the, the 08, 09 crisis, the housing crisis here was, I mean, there, there's so many things that fed into that, the credit default swaps, all, all those things. But, you know, you're, let, let's say you were, you know, living somewhere in Europe and you're just sitting there fat, and dumb and happy. And all of a sudden Lehman Brothers goes down and the U.S. goes into a really bad recession, worst one since the Great Depression, and it's affecting you. If, if that person's not paying attention to the news to some extent, they're, they're going to get caught flat footed. Yeah, I mean, I, Iceland went bankrupt. Greece almost mm -hmm. uh, went under. The, it, it, yep. it, it was a house of cards around the entire world. So Absolutely. Evergrande could definitely be that way because uh, mm -hmm. China, I think, is our biggest trading partner. Yeah, they sure are. The, so, Lieutenant Colonel Brother, the Lieutenant Colonel Brothers is on the show. I want to welcome a couple of folks real quick, Will, and then we'll kick sure. it because we're going to try to keep these shows to around 30-ish minutes mm -hmm. where you can get in, get out, maybe uh, spur some thought and spur some additional research. Lieutenant Colonel Brothers is on. Dave, uh, David Ames is on. Good morning, sir. Bruce Hi, is Dave. on. Tony is on. All right. Thank you, and please hit that share button. Will, let's get us started here, brother. All right. So uh, Evergrande is the largest, by far the largest, uh, owner and builder of housing projects, usually apartment buildings in China. They're eight times bigger than their next nearest competitor. So they're, they're the behemoth. They're the monster um, in, in the market over there. Th there's some odd things with housing in China, as there are a lot of odd things in China, period, uh, compared to the U.S., one of the biggest ones is that when a builder, say, builds an apartment building, they don't own the land underneath the building. They lease that from the Chinese government. 99-year uh, leases are very common. They're usually more than 50 years. But eventually, that chicken will come home to roost, too. Uh, I'll be in the process of pushing daisies up by the time that happens. But uh, that's something that could happen down the road. But it, it, it's an oddity to the um, <clears throat> to that market. And of course it makes you wonder what the Chinese government would do to a builder that they don't like. Do they just take the land back and now the building is in limbo? Who knows? Um, um, the, um, where a lot of this starts really is with the one child policy. Remember that rich? Oh yeah. Okay. So when they did that, uh, not to get on the political side of this, but the, uh, abortions are legal and relatively, well, very common in China. And a lot of families, if they found out they were having a daughter, would choose to end that pregnancy uh, so the family name would be carried on. So the upshot of that now is that you've got about 30 more, 30 million more marriage age males than females. Yeah. I remember Go ahead. Uh, now I was going to say that that's uh it's funny when people start experimenting with these, you know, we're going to put this law into place, how it has these unintended consequences. You know? mm -hmm. And, you know, let's just say generically 25, 30 years ago when they put that law in place, did anybody think that this, this was going to happen? Did they think about it at all? You know, they, who knows? So you, you got 30 million more guys walking around. I mean, when we were young and on the dating scene, it was basically 50, 50 and that was competitive enough. Right. Exactly. And <laughs> so, we're going to, and you're going to talk more about how this complete excess of men really is, is partly to fuel this evergreen, uh, evergrand, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, time bomb, if you will. Yep. Um, so, you know, since the marriage market is so competitive to find a wife over there, the, the guy's got to bring everything to the market that he can. And one of the big ones there is, is home ownership. Uh, and their home prices have been increasing at 10 to 15% annually for years, maybe even more than a decade at this point. And that makes it very difficult for anybody to own a home because the prices are, are, are out of the, this world. Um, the, so what, what happens is the, the families, the grandparents, the parents and the child, they all pool their money together to buy junior a home so he's more competitive so the family name can be carried on. Yeah, um, I want to <clears throat> I want to back up to something you talked about cuz uh, uh, maybe we can circle back to this at some point later in the in the show. Mm -hmm. One of the problems that I, I foresee, potential problems I foresee is something similar to uh, Northern Ireland when my ancestors came over in the in the late 1700s, early 1700s. Uh, was rack renting. 
So you didn't own the land. You leased the land for a, a period of time. It's very similar to China for 30, 40, 50 years. So much so that, you know, two or three generations could go by. Well, they're working the same little piece of land. Then all of a sudden an absentee landlord from England comes over and goes, yeah, I'm raising the rents 400%. If you can't pay, you got to get off my land. Ooh. And it's almost like they had forgotten that, oh, no, we don't own this land. You know, we've been mm -hmm. farming it, taking care of the soil, and now you're kicking us off. And, of course, it fueled about 400,000 uh, poor Northern Islander, Irelanders. Does it work? Anyway, <laughs> to, come to, to come to North America. So I say all that to say, I wonder if something like this could drive an immigration crisis somewhere down the road. Maybe I'm looking yeah, too far I, into it. I think that's that's pretty intuitive. Um, and, and it goes back to what we're talking about. You, you know, we, we have to know our history because I had no idea that happened over there. So, yeah, you could easily see a, a out migration of, of Chinese men to, well, we're, really anywhere in the world, wherever there's looking, wherever labor is needed. Yeah, looking for land. They're looking for opportunity. They're looking for wives mm -hmm. or, you know, better yep. economic conditions. I'm sorry. Well, go ahead, sir. No, no, that, that was a that was great. Um so the other side of, of it is with the way the housing prices have gone up in China, um, there are not a lot of um, there, there are not a lot of other investment opportunities. But there aren't uh, to the best I've been able to find. You can't have an IRA, a 401k, any of that stuff in China. So if you're trying to build wealth towards retirement or to hand over to your um, uh, to your children and grandchildren, there's not a lot of options. Housing is one of the few. Um, so that has, you know, fueled this increase in um, in the home values because there's a great demand and there's really nowhere else for them to put the money. There are a few options. Evergrande also, we're going to touch on this later, Evergrande also does wealth management. But the way it's done there is you hand them your money and they go, okay, we're going to pay you X percent per per year for it. And you don't get to have so much in the S&P 500 and this much in Facebook stock or what have you. They, they just invested and you get what you get. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you could see where there could be a speculative bubble coming down the road with something like that. Mm-hmm. Yep. And, and the, there isn't the, transparency in the investments in their, in their wealth management either. So, so they're paying you, you know, I'll, I'll just make up some numbers here. Say you're, you're getting a 10% return. Well, is it really 10%? Don't know. Um, that it, it's, it's a, like, like a lot of things over there, it's, it's a very closed loop system. And unless you're inside the loop, you just don't know. Um, I, I yeah, I mean, uh, Michael Burry, I don't know if those of you watching this morning are going to be familiar with Michael Burry. Dr. Michael Burry has uh, had a, uh, or still does, a wealth management company called Scion Capital. He predicted the mm -hmm. housing market crash in 2008, 2009. And Dr. Burry, you know, has been kicked off Twitter a few times or warned by the SEC to stop tweeting because he's very prophetic. And he, mm -hmm. back in July of this year, was talking about Evergrande saying you know mm -hmm. you better watch watch what's going on with evergrande and he is always ahead yep. of the uh, curve so here we are yeah he's an interesting yeah he's an interesting cat i i, I believe his twitter handle is cassandra which mm -hmm. is she was the greek goddess and uh how does that go rich it, she was cursed to pr correctly predict the future but no one would believe her was i think that was it um yeah it was something like that. So basically, he, he he's cursed to predict the future and nobody will listen. Yeah. And, so and, it's, uh, it's, and that's what he said. He goes, you know, before the crash, you know, uh, people say, well, you weren't out there telling us. He goes, well, I'm telling you now. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, so um, another major difference compared to our housing market for the for the Chinese is they pay for the home before it's built. And so the, and it gets even more intricate because they don't really take out the full mortgage. They put down their down payment, uh, you know, you're 10 or 20% down like we would do here in the U.S. They put down whatever that percentage is. The uh, builder essentially co-signs for that loan 
and then the, the bank loans the builder the money to build the building. So if Evergrande does start to fail, that could roll downhill real fast. If they default a few times, then suddenly these banks aren't willing to loan for future projects. And that, that could roll downhill very rapidly. Uh, and of course, the people who put their down payments down, nobody knows what will happen with that if the builder goes under. So that that's another portion of this to keep an eye on. Yeah, because it's, you know, I is China going to bail out everybody that lost money? No, probably not. Well, and You're just going to be broke. Pro yep, probably not. And then it gets even when we talk about their bonds here in a few minutes, it gets even deeper than that with the the Chinese government doing bailouts because we've gotten so used to that here in the U.S. Well, they they've got a twist on that that is going to make it much more complicated to try and do over there. So, but isn't one of the big problems that's contributing to this is the home value to income over there is so so uh wonky. oh it's in i mean we think it's crazy in the u.s right now and and they would love to have what we have um i'm gonna read this off my sheet because i can't keep these numbers straight otherwise in my head it just doesn't make sense right now in the u.s all right, I'll, sh I'll start it this way actually at the peak we were 7.03 the average home home price selling price was 7.03 times the median income this is back in 06 07 right and we thought it was nuts back then right now for comparison so if i make, if i understand if i understand this correctly just to make sure i'm following you will if i make a hundred thousand dollars that means i'm my home value is normally about seven hundred thousand just rough numbers is that correct, correct on that yes okay. that is correct so and we know what home prices have done really since the pandemic started with all the stimulus money right now we're at 6.91 here in the US. So we're getting back to that, that dangerously overvalued level. Um, and we see we see that everywhere, right? Uh, across here in the US. Well, the Chinese would love to have those kind of numbers. Yeah. Um, <laughs> currently, the average for China across the entire country is 17 times the median income. Wow. Yeah. It's so again, I mean, if I make $100,000 in China, uh huh. My home is 1.7 million. Yep. Right. Okay. So, and that's why it takes the all those generations to come up with the down payment, and then Junior better have a pretty good job to make just make the the monthly payment on it. Yeah. But but the flip side though is it, it becomes that self licking ice cream cone because it's going up 10 percent annually. So, which that actually brings in something else we'll we'll talk about here in a minute. We'll get through these numbers and then we'll we'll talk about reselling homes over there because that's a whole nother cultural thing as well. Mm -hmm. So in, and I'm probably going to butcher this name, Shen, Shenzhen, I believe is how it's pronounced. It's 40, over 46 times. Yeah, the home value is over 46 times the income in Shenzhen. Shenzhen. So if you got a hundred thousand dollar a year job, you're paying 4.6 million. Am I, did I do that right? Yeah. That's insane. That 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 math doesn't work. Okay, <laughs> and I'm just gonna I'll just run through the rest of them here. Uh, Hong Kong is 46 times, Beijing is 46, Shanghai is 37 times, Tokyo is a relative bargain at 13 times. Uh, now we'll we'll throw in some some other cities just for um, comparison. Vancouver, British Columbia, up in Canada is 11 times. Sydney, Australia is 9.9 uh, .9 times. And New York City looks pretty affordable at 9.3 times. So, yeah. you know, that that's why they're they're having to pool all these resources to 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 buy a home. Uh, so the junior is competitive in the dating market. And it, so again, if you're just joining us this morning, someone shared this with you. My name is Rich Brown. I'm joining with Will Wood, and this is Emerging Threats Monday. And we're talking about Evergrande and why this should be on your radar, not just if you're investing or not investing. This could have ramifications across the entire uh, world economy. And Will has given us some of the backstory as to why this is uh, such a cal potential calamitous event with Evergrande. So go ahead, Will. I'm sorry. No, no, yeah. Um, so here in the u.s you know we would i you know the standard is you start off with a starter home right i mean i i know the the bride and i started off with a 900 square foot home and paid we weren't making a lot of money at the time and over time we've stepped up the standard u.s path pretty much right well 
one of the major differences with the Chinese is you don't buy a used tile solder used, right? Because they're culturally, they believe that if you do that, you're, you're going to pick up the previous owner's bad luck. So very few homes get sold. If they do, they get sold at a very deep discount. Um, so it's, it's a, it's a very odd, I find it very odd cultural thing as their deal, whatever it's, it's all good for them. Um, but this is also why people who do have some wealth and can invest over there, they will buy homes and let them sit vacant for two, three, four, five years because you're, they're waiting for it to appreciate that 10% annual appreciation that's been going on. They're just waiting for it to appreciate so they get a return on their investment. But in the meantime, it won't be rented. It won't be sold two, three times. It'll just sit. And part of that is probably, I would imagine, to let the bad spirits get out of the house. <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, I'm not laughing because I'm trying to be sensitive to their culture, but I mean. Yeah, but it'll sit empty the whole time. And there'll never be any, um, there'll never be a sale until they, they get a return on that investment. So that's where, have you ever heard about their ghost cities over there, Rich? I have. Yeah. Yeah. And part of the, part of the theories out there is maybe some of those cities were, were built, you know, obviously the infrastructure was built by the government, but a lot of those buildings might've been built purely on speculation. We, the, we don't know though. Um, yeah. So, go, so if you're, if, does that mean they don't buy investment properties over there or they do? I could, I couldn't really nail that one down. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if the uh, bad luck transfers from renter to renter. Uh, I would imagine there's a rental market over there, especially in the larger cities, because you, you got to live, they have to live somewhere. And not everybody's going to be able to put together that, that down payment for that, that huge home price there. Mm -hmm. So I was just out of curiosity. I, I started off on a, a couple of the more well-known real estate sites here in the U S that everybody uses and wound up finding, finding some listings over there uh, for rentals. And it's, there are some rentals over there, but it's, I mean, it's unreal. I mean, eight, nine, ten thousand $10,000 a month for a, a two bedroom place. Yeah. And part of the problem of getting information out of China, as you'll see in today's show notes, I've got all the references that we'll use to put this uh, little 30 minute discussion on Evergrande. And it's, it's a lot of references because we're having to triangulate the news here because China is kind of a closed loop, right, Will? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, everything from their uh, from their economic news, their GDP numbers, their their consumer price index numbers, all those. Uh, you can compare this quarter to last quarter and this year to last year, but everybody in in the investing world knows you're just comparing a lie to a lie. You're really more looking at the trend. Exactly. And let's talk about that real quick. You know, we we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, and I think it's important to discuss again, uh, a trend line, you know, so mm -hmm. as most of the folks on this morning, Matt Sims is on Mark few, Dr. Fuller, uh, uh, Brady, lots of folks on this morning that are shooters. Will, of course, you and I both, we fire a three shot group, right. Mm -hmm. And then make a dope adjustment because we got right. three rounds and then we can move. We don't move every one. So we're looking at trend lines here mm -hmm. and that's what we're, tr that's what we're trying to do. Uh, look into our crystal ball by looking at trends. And if you find the same kind of thing from multiple outlets, then it, the, the ability for it to be somewhat reliable tends to increase. You could also say the same for, I mentioned it a while ago, my wife, she's over there doing a puzzle right now at our farmhouse. And uh, if I picked up one of those puzzle pieces, you would have no idea what it is. Mm -hmm. It's just a piece of information in isolation. Right. Mm -hmm. I, if I handed you 20 or 30, suddenly you start to, to realize what the picture may be. Oh, it's a sunset right. and stuff like that. So now we're getting from information to intelligence. And that's what we're trying to do with the, the myriad of references that you gave us this morning. Go ahead. Yep. Sir. And, and the one thing that I've finally wrapped my, my small little brain around the last few years is humans tend to think in a linear fashion. It's the stock market is going to keep going up with this. Yeah, it'll bounce around, but it keeps going up like this. And it'll go down like that when it goes down. Well, look back at 08, 09. Look at the pandemic crash. It, things don't move in a linear fashion. They Once they get going, it's, it becomes exponential very fast because humans are involved in, and we become irrationally exuberant or we panic, right? There's yeah. in between, most people are pretty much asleep. So yeah, 
there's a great book called Predictably Irrational. Uh, okay. It's definitely a good read because uh, we're irrational, but sometimes in predictable ways. It's interesting. Mm -hmm. book. Go yeah, ahead, I'll check that one out. Uh, it's like, you, you know, Hemingway went broke, uh, went bankrupt famously, you know, back in his day. And he made a lot of money, obviously. And uh, uh interviewer asked him, how, how'd you go bankrupt? And he said, slowly at first and then all at once. Yeah. <laughs> so that's something I try to keep in mind as well for my, uh, you know, personal stuff. It's like, yeah, I, I, how about we have a little bit of risk management and safety here and that includes some preparations and, and knowledge like we're going over here today. Yeah. Mark Hamilton is on from Toronto, uh, uh, Canada. Good morning, sir. Thank you to the 17 folks joining us live. Please hit that share button. Cause now, Will, I want you to tell us, give us a little facts about Evergrande, if you don't mind. Okay. So just, just to kind of wrap our heads around what we're talking about because when I first started thinking about this, I'm like, that's eh, a builder. What, what's the big deal? We got, you know, thousands of them just in the state I live in. What's, what's, what's so big about this Evergrande? Um, well, like we said at the beginning, they're eight times larger than their nearest competitor. Uh, they've got, uh, they own 1300 projects right now in over 280 cities and they're managing 2,800 additional projects in 310 cities. Uh, so it's a gargantuan company, um, 200,000 employees, uh, and then, of course, all the suppliers and, you know, uh, other companies that depend on them. I mean, you're, you're probably talking well into the you got to be talking well into the millions of people who whose uh, financial lives revolve around Evergrande. Um, there's uh, seven units in the company. Uh, they've got electric vehicles, um, which since you and I talked last, Rich, I saw that they uh, they were going to do a stock offering for the electric vehicle portion of the company, and they have suspended that. They are no longer going to offer that stock. Uh, they also have healthcare, consumer products, a TV production company, wealth management, um, which we'll touch on here in just a moment, and they even own a theme park. Um, uh, so, I mean, we're talking about a, a company, that their tentacles reach all over the country and into a myriad of, of uh, uh, places in the economy. Yeah. And like you said, uh, what there's a whole lot of things driving this ever again. So you got this giant, you've got cultural things, you've got the, the one, one child policy. You, you've got mm -hmm. the fact that they, the average Chinese citizen doesn't own an IRA 401k. It's all tied up in their, their, uh, property that they own but remember they they might own that piece of that little apartment unit but they don't and they never will own the land that it's sitting on go ahead sir. right yep um so evergrand is as their their troubles have mounted here um you can imagine how much paint they go through uh it's it's got has to be just a staggering amount of paint well they recently paid off a paint supplier a bill to a saint saint uh paint supplier uh by handing them handing over the deed for a property Said, here you go. Here's here's the deed for the property. Now you're we're even. The only problem was the property wasn't finished. But you know, who knows how that'll turn out? We know how it would go here in the states. There'd be lawyers involved and so on and so forth. Who knows what's going to happen to that paint supplier over there? Because they're not going to get a, any other kind of payment now, and they have people to pay and infrastructure and so on and so forth to take care of. Um, so they're they're starting to do some weird stuff to try and pay their bills. Now that, that they do issue bonds, correct? They do, um, and they missed. Th this is where, like you were talking about, you have to really watch the news. And at first, I thought, "Holy cow, what what happened here?" Because they they had a big big bond bond payment due a week ago on the twentieth. Uh, I'm sorry, on the twenty third. Apologize. Uh, the and I saw some headlines that they had made their bond payments. I was like, well, that's weird. Where they where they get the money from? Because nobody knew what the the Chinese government would do. And I thought, wow, maybe they bailed them out. Well, what they did was they've got uh, domestic Chinese domestic bonds that are priced in uh, renminbi, renminbi. They paid those. They they paid the coupon, paid the interest on those. They didn't. The, but all the bonds outside of china are priced in us dollars none of those got paid so yeah. they're not technically in fall in default for 30 days 
So they've got 30 days to pay that. Now we don't, nobody knows what's going to happen with those. Um, are they just going to tell the global investors to deal with it? Too bad, so sad. Um, did the Chinese government, you know, bail them out and give them money to, to pay the domestic stuff to, to keep from having any domestic internal strife there in China? I mean, we don't know. Um, I know I'm glad I don't own any of their bonds. Um, the, but you know, this can, who knows, maybe this is like an 08, 09 thing. If, if somebody has a, a bond fund out there, do they have some of those bonds? Unless you dig into the the materials on your uh, investments, I don't know. Well, and I don't know. I don't know hardly anything about the U.S. bond market, but I would imagine that most bonds uh, issued by American companies are going to be paid in U.S. dollars. And I think it would probably shock a lot of people to know, to think that in China and, and certainly a lot of countries in the world, the bonds are uh, paid in U.S. dollars. And I saw somewhere where. It was like uh, that that is a market outside of the U.S. market, what we do with our dollars, like to the tune of like 12 trillion dollars in U.S. Mm -hmm. currency sloshing around the world, being paid back by foreign companies that issue their bonds with pay, payable in U.S. dollars. It's an interesting problem, but it goes back to the problem why Evergrande could be such a, uh, a, a huge problem for the world. Mm -hmm. Yep. Sure thing. Uh, and. I've been doing some research lately on, on the bond market and the equity, the stock market. And, you know, we all talk about the Dow, the NASDAQ, the Russell, all these things with the stock market. The bond market dwarfs the equity market. I mean, the, the, the bond market is the dog that wags the tail of the equity market. Um, that might be one we touch on later on because I, I I've been amazed some of the things I've learned about the bond market. Um, and the, the bond market almost always gets it right. Um, the, the stock market is more emotional because there's more regular folks out there trading the, the, the equity market, the stock market, but that's maybe we'll talk about that. Maybe we'll have that discussion some sometime in the future. Yeah. So if Evergrande starts defaulting on their uh, bonds backed by us dollars, is that something the Chinese government can just hand them a, a couple crazy of us well, dollars and let them pay it off? Obviously the Chinese government can't print us dollars. Um, but I've been, I've been thinking on this and, you know, they own a, the Chinese government owns a lot of U S debt, a lot of uh, U S treasury bills. Could they quietly cash some of those in and then give that money to Evergrande and Evergrande pays the bond holders, I guess what's that, but then what does that do to our interest rates here? What does that do to our, our debt situation as a country here? Nobody knows. Now, could they do that very quietly through the federal reserve? I, I guess, you know, um, maybe an intrepid reporter would turn that up. I don't know. Now, I would imagine that the, the Chinese investors are, are now that they've started to default. Now, of course, they have 30 days. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're just late at this point, right? They haven't technically Correct. defaulted. But I would imagine right. that the people holding those bonds are pretty pissed off, right? I would be. You know, yeah. I'd, I'd be I'd be looking for somebody to have a conversation with. Um, yeah. And. That that leads into the the folks that uh, are using Evergrande for wealth management there in China. The Chinese people, uh, they uh, on the 13th of September, uh, they went to the Evergrande headquarters and uh, protested. And I'll, I'll use the word they stormed the building and actually took uh, a number of the workers uh, hostage, wouldn't let them leave their offices, said, we want our money. Uh, and that's as we know from the past, everything back to Tiananmen Square the Chinese government does not play around with, with that type of behavior. No, they certainly don't. Uh, so where do you, where do you see this going? I mean, you know, I, I, that's where I think they'll, they'll definitely domestically, they'll do whatever it takes to make those people whole because they can't let this turn into, you know, the elites are getting rich while the commoners are losing their retirement. They, they in my opinion, they just can't let that narrative take hold because if that happens, they're going to have huge unrest. And then you couple that with all the fake economic numbers they've had and, and the way the pandemic is, has altered everything now. And, you know, their, their factories are starting to slow down over there because they can't ship goods because there aren't enough cargo ships. Right. Yeah. yeah. So they, they, 
my opinion, there's no way the Chinese government lets any kind of protest take hold. They'll they'll pay these people off and just call it the cost of doing business. Yeah. Shan Hip Hill is on, says, happy Monday, Rich and all. Uh, Greg is on, says, good morning, everyone. Coin number 2016. If you want to find out what a coin number is, please uh, check out American Warrior Society. Matter of fact, if you want to get a real cool hoodie, American Warrior Society hoodie, they're available on our store. Uh, he says he started to have coffee withdrawals, missed coffee with Rich. And today's, co of course, coffee with Rich and Will. We're going to give you about 30, 40 minutes of something to think about. And today is Evergrande on emerging threats. John is on from Yukon, Oklahoma. Jo Joseph is on, and our dear friend Alan Kelly is on from Occupied Virginia. And we're talking about Evergrande, folks. So one of the things that Will was just talking about is how the Chinese government cannot allow these protests to devolve because it really tears at the narrative of uh, what they've tried to build. And one of the things that's been attributed to Marx, but he didn't use these words, is late stage capitalism. Mm -hmm. And it's something that uh, we won't go into. Maybe we'll do it on another show. But uh, one of the things that people have said, or China specifically said, is the reason the Russians got it wrong is they jumped straight from feudalism to uh, the socialist utopia without going through capitalism first. And it's something that Marx said was, was necessary. So we could be looking at late stage capitalism in China and that could have some serious effects because mm -hmm. here's a, a communist utopia that's trying out capitalism. Anyway, uh, so what's next, man? Uh, what are they gonna do? You know, well, the, the truest answer to that is who knows? Um, now, one thing I've been thinking on and pondering on is will the US government uh, through proxies bail out Evergrande to create some sort of contagion from happening uh, throughout the world, like our housing crisis in 08, 09. I mean, I, I'm sure you remember, Rich, when that happened, you know, the $700 billion bailout, we, none of us could wrap our heads around the $700 billion. Oh my goodness. The bailout private companies, this is ridiculous. Well, now we're talking three and a half trillion for an infrastructure bill, right? So to throw you know, a few hundred billion dollars, a few yeah. at Evergrande to predict, to keep something from, from spreading like that. I mean, it, is it, it's possible. Sure. Yeah. But you I know? tell you what, you, you, that would be politically, uh, well, you know, you'd think untenable because you're going to take hundreds of billions of dollars of American treasure and taxpayers dollars and mm -hmm. bail out a Chinese company. Cool. And yeah, at that point, you know, we just start need to start learning to speak Mandarin and just call it a day. Yeah, and I would not do well. I don't do good with language. I, no, I'm not neither. there. I, I have a hard enough time with English at this point. <laughs> um, yeah. So, uh, just to kind of wrap it up here as we're coming up on time, Rich, um, I was looking at some stuff last night. We talked about it a little bit. When you hear noises right now about the Chinese um, outlawing crypto, Bitcoin. Uh, holding or trading over there is as we talked about they technically did that back in 2019 um however uh, for those of you that are familiar with computers a lot of people use vpns virtual private networks to make it look like they're in a different country use a use a, a broker and then the, the chinese citizen buys cryptocurrencies uh looks like they're going to crack down on that pretty hard uh, because their home prices over in China are down about 18% uh, year to date. So they're, they're going to try and since there's really nowhere else to invest that money, uh, they're going to crack down on any other option to try and slow down that uh, housing price decline over there is my theory. Uh, so when we start seeing headlines about this, uh, I think over the next few weeks, it I'm thinking it ties back into this. What's well, interesting, you know, Tony says a billion here, a billion there. Pretty soon we're talking serious money. Yeah, I forget who, yeah. I forget who quoted that, but that's that's a, good, that's a great quote. It is. And, yep. Yeah, and and I'll tell you that's um, this is something, folks, you got to keep an eye on because if if they do, if you hear Evergrande is in default, uh, it could have ramifications for me and you and our IRAs mm -hmm. and 401ks. Yep, sure could. Um, as we get closer to that date, we'll start hearing rumblings. I mean, we're we're, uh, what, 23, 26 days out from that now. If it's going to start turning ugly, I would guess that a person who is aware of these things and is watching the, the news as we come up to about two weeks out from that, will start seeing 
hints that that's going to happen. Yeah, and your point about what would the U.S. government do? You know, we had uh, TARP, was it back in 2008, 2009, mm -hmm. a troubled asset relief program or whatever they called yeah. it. It could be some sort of Chinese TARP 2.0. But what ha you know what they did was the Fed just put those uh, those toxic mortgage-backed security assets on their books and carried them around like a like an anchor around the country's neck, if mm -hmm. you will. And then what happened last year, and, and we just add more mm -hmm. to the trillions of dollars that are stuck on our books, you know. So I don't think that we should look and laugh at what's going on in China. Like, ah, hey, look at these they're clowns. They're fixing to go through mm -hmm. what we went. Because the world is so interconnected, as you said at the beginning, Will. Yeah, yeah, and there, there's so many possibilities. I mean, with with the Fed, I mean, they're they're not transparent. Um, the China, if the Chinese, you know, cash in some of their bonds, and the, basically the Fed says, "Oh, we'll we'll carry that for you to keep this from spreading about the world." We won't find about find out about that for at least months. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Shan says our economy is already under stress from the inflation price increases happening everywhere, seeing about 5% across the board from suppliers and supply chains are stressed as well. Inflation is an increase and money supply increase in prices is the effect of monetary inflation. Well said. And that's a perfect segue. Is it not? Well, you want to talk about next week? Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, so you're, you're, you're picking it up next week. You're going to, you're doing next week's right on the uh, on interest rates. Yeah, this is a great uh, segue there that Shan has given us. Yeah, next week we're going to talk about the Fed and how they manipulate interest rates. Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Uh, and how it can affect you. And all these things that we're going to do on Emerging Threats Mondays for the foreseeable future anyway is going to be give you something to think about, something to dig into a little bit. We're just we don't have all the answers here. We don't have a crystal ball. We're just looking at the trend line going, hmm. This could be mm -hmm. something that affects us, right? Yep, absolutely. Um, and, and and it'll affect every person, whether they're invested in the market or, or not, because it, it affects the economy and jobs, home prices, and therefore rent prices affects everything. Yeah, I want to talk about that real quick, because I think there's a lot of people out there that when, when you hear the U.S. economy, literally, I think a lot of people think of a, a building. They imagine mm -hmm. the U.S. economy and they imagine this building in Washington, D.C. or New York. And really, that's not the way to think of it. The way to think of it is more like Shan just said. It's it's supply chains being stressed. It's I can't get the supplies I need to build my, in Shan's mm -hmm. case, amazing holsters, right? Because somebody else makes codex. Shan doesn't make the codex in some lab mm -hmm. in his backyard. So we all we all, all have suppliers. You know, I, I've mm -hmm. been renovating my barn, as I told you before. I need nails, right? I need screws. I need lumber. Mm -hmm. I need concrete. Yep. These things yep. come from somewhere else so that the U S economy really is nothing more than my relationship with you guys and our relationship with our scarce resources. So think right. of the economy in that regard. Yeah. We don't well, have, have yep. go ahead. Will. Oh, I was just going to say, and, and right along those lines, I just read a news blurb last night in, in, uh, in England, they have uh, army uh, soldiers driving uh, lorries their tr their trucks over there right now because they're that short on truck drivers, so that supply chain is stressed to the max just just like ours is. Well, yeah, I mean you don't have to look. That's a great point. I didn't see that in the news, but I tell you, you don't have to look across the pond to see that. We have, mm -hmm. I think it was New York. They activated the National Guard to drive school buses in New York. Oh yeah, yeah, I did see yeah, that. Yeah, here in Tennessee, we have activated the National Guard to act as nurses in our hospitals since we're one of the places where COVID has hit the hardest. Mm -hmm. So we're having to do that because we can't find people to work. Um, anyway, anything else, Will, before we uh, head out for the day? You know, uh, I just see David uh, there asked what sources of international news uh, are trustworthy. Uh, none. No. None. Just like in, just like here in the U.S. I, I try to make a point, uh, you know, I'll check Fox, I'll check MSNBC, Um uh, check them all. The truth is probably somewhere in the middle because yeah. they're all playing to an audience. Um, that's it, yeah. So, and then right below that, uh, Alan brought up hyperinflation. And that's one maybe we'll get into next week with the interest rates because um, I think um, 
the the hyperinflation I, th I think is misunderstood by a lot of people and i don't claim to be an expert but there's a difference between high inflation which is what we're in and headed towards more of i think where hyperinflation uh is more loss of faith in the government and the currency hence venezuela uh someplace like that so yeah maybe we'll, we'll touch see. on that next week with interest rates yeah absolutely we'll definitely touch on that because uh th that's a doomsday scenario of the hyperinflation a little yeah. bit of inflation, not so much, but when you get to hyperinflation, it's it's a wrap, you know. Yep, absolutely. That's that's game over. That's game over. Uh, let's see. Chances zero hedge fund .com is also a decent source of economic style mm -hmm. news. Yeah, yep. there's some there's some good ones out there, but I, I prefer to triangulate the news. Like I will watch Reuters, Al Jazeera, mm -hmm. Indian News, Australian Sky News, CNN, NBC, yep. BBC. I'm I'm all over the place, and somewhere the truth lies in the middle. Absolutely. Okay. We kept you on here for about 45 minutes. I think that's a, about a wrap. Don't you will? Yeah. Yeah. I think that, that's everything I got. All right, folks be safe out there and remember the fight is coming. Be ready.